Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Met, and thank you for being here. We are going to go to the exhibition now, and I'm going to start the walk through there. So please feel free to join me there. Um, I just wanted to welcome everyone um, today, and um, on behalf of the Metropolitan Museum, and also, of course, the Met Breuer. Um, it's a great to see such an enormous group here. Um, and it's a, a wonderful time for us because it is the first time we will have uh, uh, collaborated with the Kiran Nada Museum, to which we are extremely grateful to Kiran for um, enabling us to do so. And also particularly to Rubina, who has been an <coughs> incredible force of intellectual and historical prowess throughout the development of this. Um, it was an amazing configuration at the Reina Sofia in Madrid and we decided um, not actually by nature of the constraint of the space so much but more the fact that although Nazarene's work has been seen in New York before this was an opportunity for us to make a very sort of finely focused exhibition that uh, that followed the trajectory of her career in those three decades uh, of its complexity in all of its nuance um, and notwithstanding her physical condition, which is an additional aspect to it, but much more about the, the real achievements of this very singular artist, this very singular artist who worked against the grain um, in India and whose uh, cont contribution to international modernism was something that we were very, very keen to stress. This is um, an artist who has been living in obscurity for some time, for all sorts of reasons that all of us know, um, because that's the way that the market works, it's the way media works. And it is our, um, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to inaugurate the Met Breuer with this really fantastic artist. And I hope that you enjoy the tour in Rubina's very capable hands, but also giving you a real pers uh, perspective of Nazarene's work as a human being as well as an artist. And so enjoy it. I'm not going to spend any more time wittering on. This is, this is Rubina's moment. And thank you again to the Kiran Nada Museum. It's a great privilege and pleasure uh, to have worked with you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And this has been a really great moment, a great celebration for us, for all of us, for all of you who are here. And uh, I uh, just thought to myself that having an artist like Nasreen who worked, who actively worked for more than three decades, it will be very difficult to en encapsulate everything in just 15 or 30 minutes. So uh, what should I do? Because there is a whole wealth of things that I can talk about, but I have to just delimit it. And I thought that it would be good if I could speak more about my knowing her as a teacher, as an artist and, a, and as an extraordinary human being. And really put these little stories together uh, as I talk about the works. Mm -hmm. And it is important in case of Nasreen to really, uh, what I felt um, was that uh, when I started working, I felt that unless the person is known, you know, and unless the person's intensity which because, was, because she was not known, she was a very private person, she lived her life, she created her own little world, her own little space, and she was very happy within it. And uh, she was not, she never theorized her work, she never spoke in detail, she was not interested in really theorizing or talking about her work. So everything had to be just observed and experienced and engaged by just being around her. And um, there are many here who have known Nasreen, um, you know, in terms of Nasreen's family is here. Now Jyot and Sasha can talk about uh, what a person she was. And of course, after her death, Deepak Talwar has been uh, um, showing her works uh, um, in New York and familiarizing people with her practice and uh, others as well. And of course, now Kiran, who has collected in her collection uh, more than 40 works. Um, so Nasreen was special to me, and for me, this has been always the case as a curator, working with both proximity and distance, you know, how close I could get to her and how I had to really step back every time when I was uh, uh, curating this exhibition. 
I met her first in 1976 when I joined the MSU Faculty of Fine Arts Baroda and I will start with a very interesting episode because I think that is a metaphor that I really have uh, uh, taken along when uh, working with uh, her. Um, she, we went, the first day we walked into the Faculty of Fine Arts as students and we knew that there was a teacher who was doing the foundation course in drawing and I bump into her and I say, can you just guide me to the foundation studio? And she says, are you a new student? I said, yes. She says, I'm Nasreen Mohammadi and I'm going to be a teacher. So we were like very, we just gathered and we asked her where the studio was and we were moving there with our pointed sharpened pencils and our sketchbooks open. And she says, well, no one goes to the studio. Today, you're all going to follow me and we are going to clear the, we are just going to pick up all the litter from the, on the ground in this faculty and clear everything, clear all the pathways, okay? And we were completely taken aback. Here was a teacher in a white, spotlessly clean cotton sari with a black bag in her hand and she was actually picking up things yeah. and, and we were all put through the exercise. And several years later, I realized that it was always important for Nasreen to clear the path. And that clearing of path was like to be able to have a clear vision to, to see things clearly. And uh, every time that we, um, we students met, it was something else. She was a very different teacher in Baroda. Most teachers used to demonstrate, teach in a very different way. You know, there was this uh, thing about uh, drilling you and making you understand the skills that you are supposed to learn. But Nasreen was so special. She used to just walk us to the parks and gardens next door where you had the Sayaji Bagh garden. And she would be walking us there and our classes used to be in the open air. And what was very interesting was she was always sensitizing us to, there is a need to be acutely aware of your environment and things as they change around you every moment. And I remember it was a great moment. Sometimes she used to be, she used to get in this performative mode and suddenly say, stop. I see a leaf falling. And there would be exactly a leaf falling from the, and I would wonder how did she have this, how did she know? How did the leaf tell her that, you know, and she, the leaf would fall and sometimes just, she, okay, you're hearing an echo there. Could, can, you, can you hear that echo? And we were amazed at how, how conscious and how aware she was of everything that was happening around her. And I think that was, this was a great learning because she uh, was not a teacher who believed in very pedantic ways of teaching and a conservative kind of teaching. She never, never spoiled a drawing made by a student, never drew a line over it, never spoiled it. She would always watch it for a very long time and then we say, and just that much, a gesture, this is good or this not working <laughs> and we would know that yes she signaled something that she's found and the other thing that I now when I see her works I see all this coming back to me she sensitized us to natural light and to shadows so we would have these classes out and she would make us she would say you can choose any tree that you want to sit in front of and please capture the capture the tones and of course sunlight is fleeting and changing all the time. So you have time only till noon, because after that everything will change, isn't it? So we would be capturing these tones and the tonal gradations and lights, and that would be the lesson. And it went on and on. And then what happened was in the, in the late 70s, we started feeling that she was not okay or something was wrong with her physically because she was twitching in the classes, she would be shaking and, uh, should not be walking straight. And we realized, we never knew, she never told anybody, but just this realization that something was not really uh, okay. But she would be so warm and welcoming. And then I had a very strange experience. She called me once and said, well, I came to know that you have got great marks in Hindi, great grades in Hindi. I have to pass an exam without which I would not get a permanent lecturership in Baroda, okay? So you're going to, let's have a deal. You will teach me Hindi every evening and I will give you extra time to review your drawings, okay? So I said, okay, and we were neighbors, so that was possible. 
So <laughs> I said, that's fine. So I used to go every evening and then, okay, she would never like to send anyone away from, uh, students used to love her, they used to hound her. So she, he would, she would say, you will ring the bell thrice so that I know it is you, okay? <laughs> so I used to ring the bell thrice and then she would open the door. I'm quietly uh, speaked in and I'm there. And I realized she was not interested in Hindi. She was interested in the script, but she was not interested in learning Hindi. But I had to really force her to do it because I wanted her to pass the exam. And then uh, she would after a while say, OK, I think now it's OK. I'm going back to do my work. And when we were in this discussion, most times I realized that she would just blank out and go in some other space. She, was, she used to go into a trance almost. And her, she was not there at all, I would feel. And then I would ask her, Nasreen, and she'd say, OK, I think I have to get back to my drawing board. And what an amazing, amazing experience that studio was, that home was. It was completely austere and sparse. It had nothing there barren walls, bare rooms. She had a drafting table in the center of her room with a low hanging lamp and she would sit on the floor cross-legged like a tapasvi, like a yogi, you know, sit there. And she would draw her lines with the rapidography uh, rotary pens and with her ink. And she could do that for hours in the calm of the night because till evening she was teaching. And she would play only classical vocal music, Hindustani, listening to Bhim Sen Joshi for hours on. And that would be the scene I would see almost every day. And as I said earlier, she would after a while get oblivious that I was there. You know, she was oblivious to everything that was there. And she was just immersed in her work till I would then try to be fidgety. I was barely 17 years old. I would get, oh, what am I doing here? I'm restless now. And then she would look at me, wink at me, and then light her smoke and take a break. And I never understood her work then because it was so intricate, but I knew it was something so neat, so detailed. And I'd ask me, she'd keep her work and say, she'd stand there and watch, look at her work and say, so what do you think? And I didn't know what to say. So most times I would say, very neat lines. <laughs> That's all I could say. I never understood a thing. And I would just have this answer and she would smile and she would say, do you see, do you see yogic meditation? And I said, oh my God. <laughs> I, I, so I was not really thinking of anything like that. I was just looking at that work. In the due course of time, you know, we really grew very close and um, I think because I was a very shy, introvert person, she started opening up in front of me. And um, we would meet, we would have uh, these little time when we would share a few personal things. And um, I realized that she was somebody who had extraordinary strength and conviction. She, her life from the 1960s, late 1960s, since then she realized that she was suffering from Huntington's chorea, which is, uh, as you know, a neuromuscular degenerative uh, condition. And uh, she, was con she lived with the consciousness of her impending death for so long. And she had a series of deaths of close ones, like she lost her two brothers, her father, her young nephew, and I lost my father when she, he was 47, and so there was this Thing. But what I learned from her was this, every time she was actually digging inner energies and trying to take inner strength from everything that happened in her life, the intensity of her life was that the moment she realized she was suffering, she wanted to live alone. She wanted to battle her every, every fight <coughs> alone. And therefore, she insisted. Her family so loved her. She had a wonderful family. There were eight siblings. There was a huge family. She realized she had to be alone. She had to be with herself. And she had to live in solitude and work. And that would be her therapy. And that would be the way for her towards what she was looking at. And so I always feel when I look at her work that her work is expressive in very subtle and distilled ways of her journey right starting from her early works where you see she was working with ink washers, she was working with uh, lines, she was working with um, uh, print, in print making. But every time that you see those works, you get a sense of 
everything weathered, beaten, washed away. And you know, what was most important and which was discovered much later were her personal diaries. She had these pocket diaries. I used to see her, you know, write them, but she never revealed what she wrote. They were, they were something like what I call uh, mechanisms of coping, you know, where she would draw from poets, uh, both uh, Indian poets, from uh, Western poets. Rilke was very important. Camus was very important to her. Uh, Ghalib was important. You know, Iqbal was important. And all these people who have elevated this whole sense of uh, loss, you know, into some into a metaphysical, uh, you know, in a, into a metaphysical uh, realm, and uh, she would write these things. And what we find is that the, the the journey is all between. It's just moving between courage and despair, you know. And she's going through those moments all by herself. Sometimes she would be extremely exhilarated and say, "Oh my God, today, you know what has happened in my work." I see the birth of a triangle. Okay, that would be just one line. That's it, you know. And uh, so, when we got to read these personal diaries when they came into public domain, a lot of other critics could really s look into her life. And there are these moments, like in nine, late 1960s, she's on a train to Baroda and she writes, you know, speaks softly, you know, my uh, dig inner energies, you know, my lines speak of. Dest uh, my lines speak of death, of troubled destinies of death, you know. And there were these moments where she would uh, write these things. And beatings of life, that was dimensions out of solitude was another, you know. Working from within was another, bringing everything to an inner necessity. And these kinds of little things would, these little phases would come out in her diaries. And that is what, that is exactly what I saw when I, when I used to see in her. You know, so what I'm going to do when we go into the first section, I'm going to tell you just briefly what I see in these works and how then why and how and why she moved to making from a nature-based abstraction. Why did she move to geometric abstraction? And this was this is what I personally feel why that shift happened in her. So I'm just going to walk here and love you to be in this space to see. So as Sheena said that she worked against the grain, I just want to expound a little bit on that. That uh, in Baroda, where she was uh, teaching, it had a very dominant figural narrative practice. And Nasreen somehow was doing something which was, I think nobody was doing in India at that time. You know? And on the one hand, there was such an emphasis on oil paintings, on working on larger canvases, on doing you know, large scale canvases with you know, narrative complexities and things like that. And here was Nasreen. She chose, after just a few canvases, she decided that she was not going to work in oil. She was ready to shun this uh, medium, which is very forgiving, actually, you know, unlike uh, watercolor or drawings. You know, a little stain, and it is there forever. It's a permanent mark forever. But she, she loved that. She wanted to really take on, take on the challenges of working on paper, enjoying the fragility of paper, working in lines and in ink washers and watercolors. That is what she, she picked up. And she was also going smaller and smaller in her work. So what you see is in, in these works, definitely the 60s, she was, she was going through a real personal turmoil. And a lot of these works speak about that. There are these, there is a messiness of some kind. There is an impulse, an agitation, which is, which is seen, you know, an emotional agitation. Sometimes she used to draw uh, dried palm leaves, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with empty veins and empty, empty skin. She, she used to make, she, go, she went so delicate with drawings. For instance, something like this was a feature used to come very regularly or very, very much in her early works something that is just left to die and left to decay. And this also is very interesting. The context is very interesting. She spent a lot of time near the sea because she, the family home was in Kihim, which was an island in Bombay. And she used to go there very often. And she used to love the immensity of the sea. And equally, she spent a lot of time in the desert city of Bahrain, where her family had businesses, where her father lived. So she loved this. Uh, 
this very vast emptiness, the stark emptiness of the desert. And both these places, whether you are near the sea or the, or the desert, you have stark light. And that light really gives sharp contrast. And the sharp contrast bring you very close to the reality of shadows. Okay, so it's very interesting how the work also took a lot from the place that she was. And I like this particularly because by this time, she was making these very delicate lines. And even when she used to teach us, she used to actually pull out a hair of hers and say, draw like this. And then she would show us, this is so delicate and so resilient. Okay, and she would literally do that when she was teaching. And uh, when I see, when I look at these works, they are like these very delicate, almost faint lines, but really resilient and standing on their own. And these were the kinds of labyrinths you will see later when she really moves towards uh, her geometric abstraction. But this is the first phase where she really was looking at nature, very inspired by nature and a nature-based abstraction had already begun. She made a very few figurative works, and the figurative works, she, would, she was not interested in the corporality of the body or the sensuous volume. She was only looking at lines. So there are broken contours that she would draw, or some fragmented detail, or, this, or the lines on the sari border. That is all she would draw. And then she just, said, she just realized she was not interested in any kind of anthropomorphic uh, representation. And, um, I think some of this I would also take back to her, her background as, as a Muslim, you know, when she was young, of course she belonged to a liberal Muslim family, but she was taught the regular prayers, she was taught the namaz, she was taught what to do. But uh, another thing that happens is that in the culture you are always taught to believe in something which is invisible, which is unseen and unknown. And that is, uh, I think in some ways, it is, an, uh, it is something that you, uh, from uh, your childhood, start learning that there is a world beyond, or there is something called an unseen force, or there is, some, there is an interest in the abstract, in the unseen, in the invisible. And that somehow must have stayed with her, or she would have questioned it, uh, you know, very early in her life. But it does bring you to introspect in a very different way, you know. You, you, you start introspecting very differently. I will quickly move to this work because this is a work I really feel uh, speaks a lot about her, her state of mind then. And I particularly want to draw attention on these works because all this will go away. It is almost like every stage of her working, she was renouncing and leaving behind something. One thing that she was going through this phase and she had to overcome it, she had to find the strength and resolve through her work. The other thing was she was leaving behind many things, color, representation, you know, and gradually moving to a very non-representational, non-objective form of working where all this goes away, you know, her direct uh, relationship with the world gets sublimated in very different ways. So this is important to me because it does show her uh, state of mind. And I, I love, absolutely love this work. So this is what started happening. Her canvases also talked about, you know, as if it is washed by the sea. The canvas has a feeling as if it is washed by the sea. All the excess is drained and gone, you know, and only some vestiges or faint traces of, uh, of uh, perceptive reality remain here. Otherwise, it's completely uh, washed away. Many artists, uh, older to her generation, and uh, then she comes to Delhi, and then finally she settles in Baroda. So she has this, she's moving in and out all the time. Um, this work, particularly if you observe the lines, the lines here which are delicate and which are freehand, till then she's doing her freehand drawing. It is already showing the tremble in her, in her working. She must have realized that her hand has started shaking and her hand was trembling and she was not able to draw the lines well. And I think at this point, it became very important for her to think how she wanted to proceed. It's very interesting. I cannot see her going to geometric abstraction without a reason completely, you know. If I have to look at it very, in a very practical way, she moved to working with precision instruments, like an architect works with a drafting table and the T-square and the set-square and the rot 
because she was not ready to, ex to really let the world know perhaps that she was going to, through this problem and she was, she was clear that she was going to face it more and more because her, her uh, muscles were involuntary shaking all the time. And that became very, very uh, clear to her. And so she started and moved towards another kind of practice, which is to work with precision instruments, to draw straight lines, and move from a free-flowing, gestural kind of work to a very ordered, mathematical, and uh, linear kind of drawing, which you find in her later works. And it's very interesting. By the time that she is doing this, I mean, this is pre that, but when you come to this work, this is one of the collages in, in this exhibition. And unlike other collages, which are very additive and excessive, you barely see the collage part in this. She was interested not in volumes at all. She was minimizing volumes. She was working with the flat surface, suggestive of depths. But she was really trying to explore the space by using these lines that create the movement. And in fact, I'm reminded of Miro and many other artists looking at this work. But it's interesting how only through, she's growing monochrome by this time. She's leaving color behind. And she's going flat in her representation. But it is not static. It is not mechanical. It is dynamic. And it has this energy where it is constantly moving, which you also see later in her lines. And this is perhaps what she picked up from some of her important envelopes and things that she used to keep. And, and she has created the structure. When even in the studio, she would always talk about emptiness. Empty yourself. Declutter your spaces. You know, her studio was spotlessly clean because she would mop it 20 times. One would think it's an OCD. Yes, maybe. But, <laughs> but it would be so clean that you, when you walk, you could see your own shadow, your own reflection. She would mop it. And the walls, I realized after a very long time, when I used to sit, sit late hours in her house, that the walls were kept barren for a reason. Because the room had low illumination, and there was this hang, hanging lamp, what would happen is, at night, shadows of trees would come on these walls. Okay, and the walls would act like screens. The walls would become screens, and you would see something so innocent moving, and she would point it out to me. You know? So for me, now, <laughs> but at that time, and they were very beautiful. The palm tree, you know, shadows coming there. And similarly, even in her photographs, she uses the ground as a screen. You know, all the shadows falling, the, the whole notion of time, the whole notion of presence and absence, the whole notion of evanescence, you know, and, move, and movement was very, very important to her. And there are many such things that she talked about. And I talked, I go back to this notion of emptiness because as we move around, we will see that she was evoking the notions of emptiness and nothingness in her work, you know. And the emptiness, when she said empty yourself, what she meant was, the Sufis believe, actually. When you see the whirling the dervishes, I don't know whether you have ever seen the Sufi dervishes when they dance. They dance and they, they, they whirl around because when they start whirling very, very uh, quickly, it is about rejecting the ego and the presence of ego. And that this ego must go so that when you empty yourself, you become a receptor of light and knowledge. That's the only state in which light can enter you. That's the only state in which knowledge can enter you. And she used to talk this to us as students in very different ways about how emptiness is important and the, how decluttering of life is important. Everything which is unnecessary must go. And believe me, she lived her life. She could actually pack everything that she owned in two drawers. In one drawer would go her small drawings, and in one drawer is her belonging. And she could move to any other place. She lived like that, almost like a person who had really done that, deliberately ordered her life, self-discipline and self-restraint, which is also reflected in her, in her work. So um, when she moved to grid drawings, I would say that she was, not taught, she was dependent on the grid for a while or the graph paper for a while because she had to practice drawing and expressing herself through lines, to straight lines. But I would, I, would, I would say that her sense of the grid was very idiosyncratic. She did not use it 
in the way that many artists have done, really. And she, and she soon even relinquished it. She didn't want to use the grid because grid really tied her in some, in a, in a very, um, in a very mathematical way or in a many ordered way. But to make the transition, she went through a stage where she had to use the grid, and she did use the grid. And what she started with was very interesting. She used to draw um, horizontal baselines. And I think there is a work. Britta, where is that work with the red uh, down? Uh, the it's on the Ayala Gallery. Oh, I'm so sorry. I got them here. OK, we missed that. OK, so there is a work here from the Kiranada Museum where we did this exercise, we had to do this exercise at the museum because she never dated her work, she never signed her work, it would be a rare occasion if she signed her work, and she never left any orientation arrows, <laughs> which was a real challenge to any art historian who really wanted to uh, make a precise chronology of her works. You know? So you had to look at the progression, keeping in mind many different factors. Okay? But also, how do you orient the work sometimes? And this has happened that in due course of time, we did have to, we did have to change some orientations because we realized more about her practice. And one of the works there, which has a burnt sienna kind of color down, half page, and then it goes black and white, that work has more than 260 base lines, horizontal lines. I mean, it was done, it was not done on a computer. It's a human hand working, and please remember her condition, you know. And 260 base lines, after drawing that, she has layered that drawing with diagonals, with diagonals, and that's how it goes. And uh, it was a moment, it was just some spark that came to us, and I just felt, oh, what is she doing here? She is making the earth the sky, the earth, the water, and the sky. So it goes from a heavy base to the horizon, okay, and then you see the sky. And that's how from dark to light, that's how the, how the lines go. You know? But, and you would see some few more works where she has used what you may find, I call it her garden, because she's drawing as if trees and their reflections down. Maybe you will see that work somewhere. And it's amazing how she created her, you know, created her vocabulary in terms of expressing what she wanted to express. And I feel that in the 70s, her works were becoming really, I mean, she was really densely making those lines. There were no space for her to, for her lines to breathe. They became that dense, you know, and the labyrinths were growing and she had to really, really come out of the labyrinth. She had to break these meshes. She had to come out of the labyrinth and free herself or release herself. So from the line, then she came to planes and from planes, she came to triangles, you know, and from triangles, she moved on to even minimizing her expression further, completely working with a frugal economy. And that's, that's the kind of progression you see of her, abst of her abstraction as well. And I have, um, for me, this is seven planes of existence. I see it in a, in a very spiritual way. It's, it's completely transcendental. We, in, in Hinduism, you talk about seven planes of existence. In Islam, you talk about seven planes of existence, you know, and for me, this is like going from one plane to the other. And this is always the case in her later works. She is moving, I think there are, her lines are really performing spiritual adventures, you know, as, as you go along. So she's using, I, as an artist, I always have to know that. Um, is she using a pentagraph pens or quill pens? She used quill pens earlier, but she moved to rapidography. Yeah. And, then, and then she used pencil lines. Pencil lines, like yes. A... Not everywhere. This is another thing, yes. This is a very good question. We were, when, uh, when we acquired the works, they were all framed. We had to open out the works because Nasreen really did not specify mediums as well. So we were, it was very tricky and she had this teaser almost, you know. Okay, find out what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, and what we found out was the lines that looked like graphite were actually watered down ink. You see, because for any artist to really work in graphite and leave behind such important works where anybody could take an eraser and <laughs> just, uh, just clean them away, 
I think was not really uh, was perhaps not was not acceptable to her. And I and I'm sure about this that she watered the ink and diluted it to create to uh, to have these gradations of tones. But in some works you do have graphite, and we uh, we realized that because when she used the graphite, she actually moved the pencil. Um, she used to hold it like this, she moved it like this and you see a twirl at the end because this is how architects also work. My husband is an architect, you know, twirl, you so see a twirl. So you, yes, she used, yes, yes, yes she did, yes. So that's where you come to know. And in some space, places, oh my God, what amazing thing she has done. She has drawn lines which have been completely been, uh, you know, there is no material in it. She has left them empty. In the sense, she has just drawn lines which are without, uh, without ink or without graphite. They're incised into the paper, but they have no material body. They've just been, it's, it's amazing how she has done that. Coming to the last set of works, and by this time, she was, uh, she was uh, very ill. The last two years of her life, she was talking less, she was moving less, she was trying to conserve her energy. And uh, yeah, it's a very, very emotional moment to tell you that many a times she, she would ask me to, put a, to tie a handkerchief on her mouth because she was drooling and her drawings would get, drawings would, and she was very, very particular as you can see in her work, she would never accept that. So it was quite a tough time and I think it's very beautiful the way she moved towards her release, you know, in terms of moving away from the mundane, moving away from the material. And in her diaries of the later period, you find this, that she writes, that my work is moving, you know, the search is for moving from a physical space to a non-physical space and from a material world to an immaterial space, okay? And so this is what, uh, where she was headed. And the economy of this expression is so beautiful because as I see it, it talks, it symbolizes for me flight. It symbolizes a release. It's like you have lifted yourself off the ground and left your body behind almost and, have, and the works have become ethereal and airy. There is, no, there is less material, less medium, less expression, less of everything. It's just, I think, like a yantra in Hinduism, you say, that you just have this little symbol which talks about this kind of a spiritual ascent. And this, they became that. More space, space became more and more, you know. There was less of lines, less of material, less of the world. So um, thank you very much for being here. And any particular work that you want me to talk about, I can and I will tell you whatever I know of it <laughs> or what was happening then in, you know, when she was doing that work. I'm ready to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The show is not only exceptionally beautiful, it's wonderfully installed in the Breuer building. And the building itself is a wonderful home for these works. And going through it with Rubina Carota, you understand what a deep knowledge she has of both the artist and her works. Really an amazing experience. When I first saw this show at the Kiran Nadar Museum three years ago, I was by myself. I wasn't in a group as I am here at the new Met Breuer and I found myself immersed in the quietness of that beautiful space of her museum. Um, when I came to see the show today at the Met Breuer, I had the wonderful opportunity to hear Cab Ca Rubina Carode speak so emotionally about her friendship, her colleague, the artist, who she learned a tremendous amount from, and then 
with a group of people, all who are embracing, lingering on every word, lingering at every picture, and really weeping uh, together. When I came here, I was kind of blown away by the beauty of the, of the abstraction of the art, art. More importantly, I think most people are not aware of Indian artists and art, and uh, especially the modern artists. And I'm glad this is being done by Karanara Museum to set up an exhibit here in New York City, which is the capital of art, modern art, in this part of the world. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Darren Overst. Uh, I'm here at the uh, beautiful uh, Met Brewer uh, at a pre-opening uh, of the exhibition of Nazreen Mohammadi, Mohammadi's art. Um, I think the key takeaway for me is it, it, it's really a beautiful exhibit that gives you a view of you know, the chronology of her work and her life and really the interplay between the two. And I think what, what strikes me is how so many of the same themes uh, were carried on throughout her life and are reflected in her art, but how the circumstances of her life, the circumstances of her illness, really are, are reflected in the progression of her art, and, and you can see that very clearly in the way that she instantiates those themes and the way that they evolve throughout the course of her lifetime. So to me, that's the most striking thing about the exhibit. Uh, the curators have done a brilliant job, I think, of bringing to life both the art uh, and the artist behind the art.